So yeah, I'm Tarek, I'm working as a technical evangelist, so I'm helping for the adoption of uh, uh, my part of the big data, Hadoop, and so on, with the uh, developer community and, uh, and, uh, and customer. And one of the discussions I had quite often is with real-time data, we saw the last two presentations, one on Flink and one before on, uh, uh, with uh, Geode about real-time data processing and ingestion. And a big discussion that I have with uh, the developer and, and uh, customer is about how do you, why and how do you move to this. And this one will be less technical than the other, the previous one. So it's really about you know, how we came to uh, streaming the data in. And if you look myself, I'm coming from the Java EE background. I've been working uh, as a developer and working on the, the lucky Java EE container of Oracle as a developer. And we do very, very heavy applications uh, on, in a one single kind of uh, box, but multiple layers internally with a database, middleware, web tiers. And we had to, to build, a, to give some flexibility to moving to this. We try to kind of create multiple sub applications that are now using this way. So you have many applications, each of one having the web, the middle, the database, and so on. And this is where the service-oriented architecture kind of pop up. And as uh, infamous for the lucky one that work with that, with the ESBs. And one of the issues we had with the ESBs, it was very nice to kind of glue again the different applications together. But the, the big challenge we had we still you have some silos in terms of technology, in terms of data, and so on. And plugging the ESB into the architecture was an issue, mostly because of performance and scalability. Now we come back to the type of application we deal with today, uh, and you can, based on the two last presentations that give some examples, you will see the volume of data where ESB was not the proper answer. If you look at the various startups, and startups is probably not a good term, I should have said, the Silicon Valley companies, <laughs> <laughs> is to compare with the companies that I'm working with on a daily basis, like more financial institutions, insurance, telco, and so on. Compared to this guy, what they have done is they move from this very large application, at least if you look at Netflix. Netflix before, uh, when I used to live in California, I was a Netflix customer. But I was the old version of Netflix, receiving DVDs every three days by the mail. And what happened, it was managed with a large relational database, large applications. From some of the teams say, say, we need to do a streaming as part of video streaming, not as part of data streaming. And they start to move a part of the application on Amazon. And this is how they build it. And they have built a totally new architectures, and you can look at different technical articles about LinkedIn, Amazon, Google, and so on. Same, they start with reorganizing the data with smaller applications, and try to expose this data with a RPC, with a REST API, <coughs> and so on, and use a kind of very small component, and move to um, a different application communicating either with using RPC between them, so it's the application calling the other application, not the bus doing the job. And in reality, you cannot really continue with this approach of having a service calling another service all the time. It's better to have something that will work in terms of the deferred processing, where you post something very quickly, and eventually you will consume it. Depending on many criteria, you will have to consume it later. And this is a very good use case for microservices. I don't know how much applications are starting to move, that, to move to this architecture. We see more and more of this. People building a SWAT team for one specific service is doing it very well, but he has to expose and consume some data. The idea is to, if you look at this, and you stay on an RPC model, you will have a glue between the different services that will be too, too sticky. Why it's a glue? And what you want, you want really to decouple that. And as part of this, 
is the microservices is a great way of working, but you want to have more flexibility. So you want messaging between or um, queues or stream of data between the different services. And in this case, you send a message from a specific application, somebody, one or multiple services will consume it. And one of the key parts you see around that is first, it has to be asynchronous. It changes completely the way you de deploy and develop the application. And why it has to be asynchronous? It's because first, the volume of data you will consume would be very huge, so you cannot control always the same latency on different, on different services over the network and so on. But also, because if you, um, one of the services could be down. Microservices applications are very, very easy to develop. They are very complex to keep up, uh, to up on living and understanding what's happening. So by doing that asynchronously, when a service will emit an event, emit a message, for example, on uh, different technologies that like we talk about, uh, Flink or uh, uh, Spark streaming and so on, you will consume the event on the other side when the service is up and running. If not, you will wait and it will consume it when it's coming back. And the volume of message you can deal with could be very, very large, but every time you will insert one <coughs> in this, if you see the number of messages that are generated behind that, we have one message, but we are uh, at the top level, one, two, three, four messages consumed or generated behind the scene. So the number of messages that you have to deal with in real time behind the scene is huge. So you need to have an infrastructure that can manage that properly. And as part of this, is this is one of the reasons the traditional message queuing system that are transactional, saving too much data, waiting for, for acknowledgement from another part of the system, won't scale. If you have millions of messages per second, and you want to have to wait to every message that has been received by every consumer that you want, it won't work. Especially if we look at something else, that is the state of the data that you have to manage. Somebody asked in the previous presentation about IoT, for example. If you want to have to deal with the state, what's the temperature in different places of the world? That does not exist. If you are in Belgium or in France, I'm telling from France, so you can guess from my accent. If you want to know which temperature is now in San Francisco or somewhere in Argentina, only with a network latency, with no problem, you won't be able to show that it's real time. And if you imagine to have sensors all over the world from many factories and you want to capture the temperature all the time, what you will accept, because it depends on the type of application you are building, but if the goal is to build and aggregate data from all over the place, all over the world, all the time, you want to stream the data. And you will deal with the fact that sometimes the network will not be available. Sometimes this data will take some time to get with it. But you want to be sure that the message comes uh, eventually to your master or backbone kind of your application. This changes a lot the way you want to build your application. So we are not talking about the state, because the state, when you take the picture, doesn't matter, doesn't matter anymore. Suppose you have this not down, the network down, or you are working on ships, uh, boats, with container on it. You want to be able to get data when they will have a satellite connection, sending data to give you, this is where my boat is, this is the status of the engine, and so on. <coughs> and think about um, a connected car. Uh, you will send message when you can using your 3D connections to the main data center. This is exactly the type of application where you see that working with stateful applications and waiting for a specific state will not work. Trying to get the data stream in using a flow will help a lot in terms of architecture. You will have a completely different approach in terms of development. And we will take, I will take one example with a concrete application when we move from a very large application to a more <coughs> microservices oriented with streams and see some of the challenges or some of the benefits in the same time. So, Imagine you are, you are building a YouTube or an equivalent YouTube uh, of uh, an application. So you have to capture from your website, and we will just look at the green part, 
when you capture a video, you have to upload it, you have to extract metadata, you have to transcode it to a format that is your format optimized, and you have to extract many thumbnails, like when you look at the video, it's very efficient. Uh, and obviously, many data will be stored in the database and will be stored inside a file system. A very common way of doing that is you do that asynchronously, but with a big service. Instead of that, many applications now, you explode that in many, many small services. Each time you have one thing to do, you create one service. For many reasons. Because you want to switch from uh, a specific file system to another file system. You want to switch from your own file system to S3 because you want to push data on the cloud. You only have this part to charge or snapshot or video metadata and so on. And instead of, once again, calling directly the Java API, your Python API, and so on, you put messaging in the middle, message queues. And you do that in a way that has to scale. Suppose you have many messages. Once again, one message coming in, many messages coming down. So you need something that scale. And this is one of the reasons uh, you have heard about Kafka, Apache Kafka, that give you this high, highly available, very scalable uh, messaging capabilities, where you put, your producer will push messages, and you will have people listening, or Apache services are listening for specific topics and consuming them. And one of the key parts for me in this, it's not only the scalability, it's what you have at the first part when I talk about the ESD. You have a lot of flexibility in the way you want to extend the architecture of your application. If you look at that, I just see, show you the information that are really business oriented. And you have many other services you want to expose to your application. And some of them will be, how do you deal with metrics? When you have the queue that is sending the message, you can use this message to populate data or do some work to have some <coughs> major exceptions because sometimes you will have issues and you want to deal. You have specific queues that will be useful or specific consumers that will be useful to do that. Checkpoint to be able to restart a specific process. Suppose when you do the submail extractions, you have 100 megabytes of uh, videos to deal with. You have an issue. You know that at 56 megabytes you fail. So you, can, you don't have to do the full parsing of the file again. You can redo that. On all this, because you will be able to send messages and consume messages dynamically using your data flow. And this is this makes a big difference. So keep in mind that in the case of Kafka or MapperStream that use the Kafka API, the consumer doesn't just pull the, the broker. It's not something that the broker, the Kafka broker, will wait for anything. He will store the data when somebody needs it, he gets it. So as, if you need more consumer, it will not have a big impact on the performance of the mobile application. Obviously, you will have detailed information about partitioning, so adding different broker, brokers in a cluster, partitioning the data to distribute the read, distribute the write, and so on. But it has, made, it has been made for that. And it's one of the reasons if you use traditional MQ solution, it's very hard to distribute. Because when you deal with transaction to say, this guy has to read only one message, once, well, the message one time, <coughs> and be sure that I alert all the brokers and the copies of the broker. This is uh, why Kafka is just limited at, at least one. So, in your application, focus on trying to get micro microservices uh, architecture and also start to use something that you will have a message queue that is very fast and very scalable. Look at Kafka, globally I would say look at Kafka. I, I say Kafka S because into MAPA we implement Kafka with a different storage based on the file system of MAPA. And you still have some part of your application where you have very large applications or very large services. You cannot build everything. What will be important is to integrate that easily. Once again, taking messages or pushing messages. Um, you will have many, many queues inside your system, many topics, many queues, and many storage. Uh, somebody asked the questions about, can I switch my transaction from a relational database to a uh, link? Yeah, sure, from the messaging, but from, from capturing and processing the data. You still have to store the data somewhere. 
choose wisely where you have to put it at the end. Most of the solution today will give you a capability to capture an event using a CDC chunk capture, CDC in progress, or to capture an event, do whatever you want to, be sure that it's consumed at least by one consumer, and do something else and save it in another part. Ah, but you still have this, you need this highly scalable, available storage. This is all the big, I will say, NoSQL, big data, infrastructure that will give you that uh, out of the box. Before taking some questions, I will give you some three use cases I've been working on. Is very, very, very common use case, and this is why Kafka has been created. It's aggregating logs or manipulating logs. And suppose you are, you are working in a very, very, very large company you want to monitor all your servers, all your devices. They will send log, you will capture the log of the device. And you will do two things, logs just to be able to capture them and do some analytics. Metrics to calculate some SLAs and be sure that you have your customer that is happy with the service you provide. You want to do that on many servers, capture that, aggregate quickly. You want to be able to do uh, some information about same in the healthcare industry. You want to be able to capture information from the uh, patients, so I would say the customer. It's a good idea. And the patients, information about medical uh, record that could be stored in the JVM database, uh, some information about the impact on specific medicine and drugs together with a specific uh, um, illness. I do some analytics, and you will just always use the write in one single view, one single way, then you can consume and have as much service as you want. And you can push from a specific, for example, in this case, I am in a hospital in the US, that I will aggregate to an hospital that is in national, globally in the US, push some data into my main data center in Europe, and do all the information. Highly distributed and using messaging, you know that you will. So, IoT one is a big, big part. For me, this is one of the stuff where we will have to deal with messaging all over, all time. All time. Get messages even, 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 even quickly inside the system. And you will have different paths depending on do you want to deal with the data in real time? Doing some alerts when you find a specific sensor or a specific value that is too high. Or compare quickly using things, for example, do some calculations and processing to be able to alert that. So you stream the data, you alert, you, you, you generate another event for a specific critical alert. At the same time, using the same topic, you will save the data in your main data lake to the analytics, to do all the work you want using SQL as before, and so during the, the day, you can do SQL on any type of data. You store the data, you, know, you stream the data in real time, analyze and process them for specific real time events. You save them on a different storage to do some uh, long term analytics or your machine learning model. So, so really, a change inside the way you want to do your application. So I invite you to quickly, if you have not, look at Kafka. The API is quite simple and cool. See how it's integrated with distributed processing, processing layer like Flink. Because in this, you will have a, a very rich toolbox to create highly available distributed systems. Thank you. Questions? How does that differ from traditional message worker? So, so it's, first, it's not transactional. So the fact that the way it saves the data, it's a more efficient way because Kafka just saves a log. So we just append data and read in the same order in all the consumers. And because it's just a log that you internally, a log that happens, it's very easy to partition. It's very easy to distribute. In the same queue will be distributed on many nodes. But also, you can duplicate in many other data centers. When you try to do that with traditional MQ, like MQ series, rabbit MQs, try to do a multi data center, highly available cluster of that. It doesn't work very well, and when it works, usually you have a latency, a long latency to get some decisions. But the important part is if your MQ today, whatever product you have, is working properly as an asynchronous platform, you don't have to change. 
But what we see today <coughs> is people are getting more and more messages. And one of the very common use cases is log aggregations, log transformation, and log processing. This traditional MQ, they cannot deal with the volume.